Welcome back, viewers. It's James Calm, your half-assed reporter, the guy on the bike. And we've got a special treat for you today. We're up here at the Whitney Museum. We're going to take a walking tour through Fast Forward, painting from the 80s. Well, I'm uh, kind of breaking with my traditional method. I'm going to uh, paste together a series of comments on the show. One of the reasons is that uh, I think this is a very important show. And also, this was all uh, happening when I first arrived in New York. In the 1980s, painting captured the imagination of the contemporary art world against a backdrop of expansive change. During this explosive period, an unprecedented number of galleries appeared on the scene, particularly in downtown New York. Groundbreaking exhibitions that blurred distinctions between high and low were presented at alternative and artist-run spaces and new mediums, including video and installation art, were on the rise. This is a piece by Kenny Scharf titled, When Worlds Collide. Now, uh, as I've put this together, I've realized that there are two or three nexuses around which most of these paintings, or groups of artists, sort of uh, orbited. One of them was the Fun Gallery, where Keith Haring, Kenny Scharf, and Jean-Michel Basquiat and have got their start, and that's basically where I hung out in the East Village. Patty Astor bumped into me one day at the Utrecht Art Store where I was working and invited me to come by. She said she'd just finished making a movie <laughs> about graffiti. This is actually an interesting piece by Kenny. Uh, I remember seeing one of his first shows at uh, Tony Schifrazi. I think this is from 1984, 85. This is nice, the way he's got tiny little figures kind of uh, layered in on this huge painting. And at that point, his paintings were tiny. And uh, of course, I was incensed because they all look like such direct uh, rip-offs of Hanna-Barbera. This is an interesting piece by George Kondo. I was uh, introduced to George uh, at the Red Bar by Don Betchler. I always uh, thought George was kind of... Uh, a little better than a lot of the other East Village artists because he was much more familiar with actual classic painting and uh, kind of what was happening in the Soho art scene. This is interesting now. We've got these two sections. We've got the kind of the Indian red section on the left with his swooping kind of Gorky-esque drawing, which I like. On the right side, we've got a white panel that's added on there, which is kind of a reference to more classic modernism. But we're going to see other tropes. I'm going to try to point them out as we go through here that other people were using. Okay, here are a couple of the superstars. This uh, wallpaper in the background is by Keith Herring, and it was derived from his designs on the wall of the pop shop, which uh, was down near Houston and Lafayette Street for, geez, about 10 years. This particular piece here is untitled uh, Magic Marker on Animal Skin. Now I remember going and seeing Keith's, one of his first shows at the Fun Gallery, and he was showing a lot of work like this. Uh, Keith actually didn't do that much work in the East Village. He pretty much went over and was hanging out with Tony Schifrazi and uh, although he influenced a lot of East Village artists, he didn't really show that often there. And I think he was more ambitious than kind of someone that wanted to get stuck in a, uh, in a rut in the East Village. He had a great uh, graphic sense. Of course, this is a prime Jean-Michel Basquiat titled L-U-N. A-P-A-R-K, I guess it means Luna Park. Jean-Michel was young when he broke into the scene, probably 18, 19, 20. And somehow he just had a natural, what I call, sort of living in a state of artistic grace. But he had great color sense. I also appreciate his melding of the text and the kind of urgent brushwork. There's his crown. It's one of his logos. And he, he died young. I think that's one of the other themes that seems to be carried out here. This 
This is a painting by Julie Wachtel titled Membership. And in a certain way, she's very typical of a lot of the painting that was happening in, I guess, more the Soho end of the 80s. Uh, but as we saw with the George Kondo, she's divided her canvas in half. This is kind of a theme that's carried on. I don't know whether that was because of people who were influenced by Bryce Martin, but uh, a lot of people were using that technique. This is a painting by a person I actually knew personally. This is titled Closed by Martin Wong. And I would estimate that this painting is probably about seven and a half by nine feet, something like that. Uh, this was from one of his last shows uh, that was staged at Semaphore East when Annie Heron was running that uh, space. And uh, in a lot of ways, this kind of uh, was a the curtain call for the East Village art scene. Martin had been very involved in that whole scene from the beginning. And uh, I guess by about 1986, when this was painted, it was wrapping up. Martin was also a great collector and uh, aficionado of graffiti art. This is by Mary Heilman. And this is mixed media. This is oil and watercolor on canvas. Now, Mary is a good example of someone that came to town, was part of the New York art scene, but after the 70s, things kind of slowed down, especially for women of a certain age, but she kept cranking and working and making her art. And uh, eventually, Pat Hearn, another East Village dealer, recognized how important she was and uh, started showing her. This is by Moira Dreyer, and this is Casein on board titled Fingerprint. Moira is another example of a young hot artist who died young, although she didn't die of AIDS or drug overdose. I think she had some kind of lymphoma or something. Also, it's interesting to see this was on a thin sheet of masonite with a nice wooden cradle on the back. And I think she showed it Mary Boone, which was another one of the areas or galleries where there was a, a group of influential painters involved. This is Ross Blechner. This is one of his memoir nori, I believe his homages to the friends and people that he'd known that had died of AIDS from the late 80s. They make a point of uh, talking about how the AIDS epidemic uh, Reaganomics, other kinds of political things were important to some of these artists. I think Ross is a very interesting and very accomplished painter, and we're going to look at the surface here. Uh, this is one of the great things about oil paint is that you can really get a great variation between the flats and the shinies, the stains, the glazing, the dripping. Also, although he's got kind of a um, raw umber ground, there are juicy little chunks of color in there that make this a very nice painting. This is by Terry Winters, and this is called Good Government. I don't have the actual dimensions, but I would say that this painting is probably something like 10 by 12 or 13 feet. Terry Winters was maybe one of the most important painters' painters for young artists when I came to New York in 1979. And uh, I still love his facture. You can see the, you know, the chunky textures and brush strokes that he builds up. And also he, uh, he has a nice kind of simple basic earth tone palette, but he's able to get a lot of mileage out of this. I mean, in certain ways, there's kind of the influence of a painter like Philip Guston as far as the, as far as the texture and brush stroke, but 
Perry also, he always has his own particular approach, and he's just, I thought, was always a wonderful, uh, wonderful painter. He was able to contrast the thin surfaces against the thicker, more build-up surfaces, dark against lights. Great uh, inventive shapes and forms he was using, but he was also biting on uh, scientific manuals. Some of these are giant blow-ups of pollen and other uh, natural forms. Always like to look at the sides of the paintings, check out the, the linen. You know, there's also uh, a certain kind of question about how a show like this comes together. Uh, who gets in, who gets out. This is an example of a painter that I was not familiar with. I'll just uh, read a little bit from the wall text here. This is Carlos Alfonso, born 1950, Havana, Cuba, died 1991, Miami, Florida. This is titled Told, 1990. In painting such as Told, Carlos Alfonso responded to a series of traumas, both political and personal. He fled Cuba in the, 1980, in the 1980s during the Marietta boat lift, a mass immigration that brought more than 100,000 refugees to southern Florida. Later, after settling in Miami, Alfonso began to grapple with the devastating reality of the AIDS epidemic and his own HIV diagnosis. Told, made shortly before the artist's death, is layered with spiritual and occult motifs and violently inscribed with a network of curving lines evoking a sense of inner struggle. A scythe is ju juxtaposed with an infinity symbol as if to suggest that physical death is not necessarily the end. As I've said, there were two or three central points around which a lot of these artists circulated. One of them was the Fun Gallery, another one was Mary Boone, and finally another th very important thing was uh, Barbara Rose's paintings of the 80s show that happened in 1979. Susan Rothenberg was one of the more important or influential artists that appeared in the painting of the 80s show. This piece is titled simply Tuning Fork, 1980, and I always, I always liked her work. This is acrylic and flasha on canvas. Let's go into the next gallery. They seem to have broken this down into the abstract gallery, the more conceptual gallery, and the figurative gallery. This is a piece by Christopher Wool, untitled, 1990, enamel on aluminum. This is another interesting development. It seems like a lot of people are painting on metal these days. If you've watched the Calm Report, we saw Sean Scully show where he's doing paintings on metal. And also Marilyn Minter has been painting on metal. I have seen this piece reproduced many times and it's actually wonderful to see it in real life because I get to see the pedimetti. And you really can't see a lot of the, the underpainting when you see this reproduced. And it's it's wonderful to see that there's there's a whole another painting that he's done in navy blue underneath here and I would I wonder if you could get in there and maybe read the erased text and find out what he was writing before he changed it to Run Dog Run. This is by an artist named Peter Kane. He was born in New Jersey, but I always kind of thought this was more of a California, like he was a California artist, of, uh, part of the photorealist movement, but he's breaking up his, his images more like a surrealist. But he is a wonderful, wonderful technician. He has an immaculate surface on here, and he does a wonderful job of rendering his forms almost as if this was something out of a snazzy automobile ad. And, uh, well, he also died young.
Well, here's a maybe one of the best David Solly paintings I've ever seen. It's titled Sexton in Dogtown, 1987, oil and acrylic on canvas. David Solly's paintings juxtapose images from a variety of sources to startling and off, often provocative effect. In Sexton in Dogtown, Solly arranges desperate elements within a grid and in a manner evoking film montage while combining pastiche of painterly styles and subjects. Okay. Not only were there about three different areas where the artists kind of congregated, another aspect of this was uh, where these people went to school. David Solly was part of the Cal Arts, what has been called the Cal Arts Mafia. He came to New York with people like Jack Goldstein and Troy Brontuk from Cal Arts. He got picked up by Mary Boone and was a friend of Julian Schnabel and they were in a lot of ways the focal point for a lot of the attention that Mary Boone got in the early 80s. I always kind of objected to the dryness of the a lot of the paintings. This is just thin acrylics brushed onto raw canvas, cotton duck. Somehow it looks better. <laughs> it looks better years later. The only other problem I would have is that he's got a workshop of many people that perform various jobs for him. So I don't know how much of this he's actually painting, but this particular piece is, is very nice. This piece is by Walter Robinson, titled Baron Sinister, 1986, acrylic on bedsheet. Purchased with funds from the Director's Discretionary Fund and a partial gift from Jeffrey Deitch, where Walter had a wonderful retrospective about six months ago. Walter Robinson took the subject of this painting from a cover illustration for a mass market paperback. One of many low-end sources he raided in search of seductive consumerist imagery. The book's protagonist, a secret agent, and his damsel in distress appear in a dramatic, suspenseful close-up, which Robinson is rendering in a hyper-expressive style. By making the figures larger than life, the artist exaggerates their idealized youth, attractiveness, and heroism. Also, Walter is a pretty good, uh, pretty good brush man. He was able to get a lot of expressive things. This piece is by Kathy Burkhart, titled Prick from the Liz Taylor series, suddenly last summer, 1987, acrylic, vinyl, fabric, and composition leaf on canvas. I, I love this uh, hand. Yeah, Kathy's done a great job on here, and I looked at that, and it made me think of Picasso's Guernica and some of the cubistic hands in that. Also, Kathy's done a whole series of Liz paintings. <laughs> I think that was the fat Liz. And I like the contact paper with the wood graining on there. That kind of alludes to Picasso and Barack's collages. And maybe I shouldn't say it, but that figure looks like Walter Robinson. Kind of <laughs> sorry, Walter. Uh, and then we get kind of scuzzy collage elements stuck in there. And I like the the type there. That kind of makes it look like some kind of bizarre movie poster or maybe the cover of a sleazy Pulp Fiction novel. This is a piece by Meyer Weissman titled simply Souvenir 1987 Ink, Acrylic and Screen Print on Canvas and I believe that Meyer was one of the people that was associated with International Width Monument and was part of the, what they called the Fantastic Four, a group of kind of second wave East Village artists that uh, got picked up by Ilyana Sonabin and shown at her gallery in 1986 and in a lot of ways represented the end of the East Village art scene and the kind of the, <laughs> the move towards the more traditional commercial end of the art world. I like the layering of this piece and the totally untouched by human hands aspect of this. 
Well, here is a wall installation that they say is supposed to uh, make people think about some of the exhibitions that they had at these little galleries that were hung salon style in the East Village and some of the other alternative spaces. There are some nice little pieces by people I wouldn't normally think of as part of that scene, but uh, this piece in the top corner is Joyce Pensado, who has started to get a lot of recognition in the last six or seven years. This is Sherry Levine, crazy cat. I like the wood. This is a very unexpected piece. This is by Glenn Ligon. And I guess this is from maybe the mid 80s. And this is someone that's, he's still using text, but he's changed his style a lot. Jonathan Borofsky. And this was when Jonathan was still putting his numbers on all of his pieces. He was counting to himself. Nice Carol Dunham piece with wood veneer on there. Another Joyce Pensado small piece. It's Kids of Survival. Uh, that black form in the middle makes me think of Wade Guyton. It's a couple of pieces by one of our favorite artists, Andrew Musulo. Very untypical of what he's doing now, but interesting. 1983. A little poem in there. Michael Hurston. Michael was shown with Paula Cooper for a while. This is a nice little Elizabeth Murray. I think this is probably the early 80s because it is shaped, but it hasn't really gotten into the uh, three-dimensional layering of her planes yet. But again, a beautiful little painting. piece by Rex Lau, who I've bumped into occasionally. It's a piece by David Vonorovich. Little sperm cells swimming around there. Another person that died too young. Nancy Spiro and Leon Golub, collaborative piece. Now we'll uh, slip into the last gallery. This piece is Lim, 1981, by Louisa Chase. And, well, this makes me sad. I'm just reading here on the wall label. She passed away in 2016 in East Hampton. For Louisa Chase, painting was a constant search to hold a feeling tangible. Imbued with a sense of foreboding, Lim presents a headless silhouette hovering ominously within a web of sinuous branches. Here is in many of her paintings, Chase merges a fragmented body with elements from nature in a mystical abstraction. In the late 1970s, she invented a lexicon of motifs to examine the multiple layers of feeling or experiences. Chase, Chase's interest in more subjective and narrative content aligned her with a diverse group of painters from this period known as neo-expressionists who brought renewed interest to figurative subject matter and similarly drew on personal and psychological, psychologically potent imagery. Louisa was also one of the artists that was featured in the Barbara Rose's paintings of, painting of the 80s show and I always liked her waxy surfaces. This piece is by the wonderful Robert Colescott titled Three Graces Art, Sex, and Death, 1981. In this painting, Robert Colescott playfully reimagines the classical trope of the three graces as personifications of art, sex, and death. Each is adorned with a set of attributes. Death holds a dagger and is accompanied by a skull. Sex, ironically the only clothed figure, carries Eve's forbidden fruit in her hand. At the center, Art holds a chisel and a hammer as she reworks an egg-smeared self-portrait of the artist Cole Scott's cartoonish figures satirize racial and sexual stereotypes to expose the dominant 
European discourse from which they emerge. Well, I've been a fan of Robert Colescott for years, and uh, even as a young student at the Art Students League, I would uh, walk down 57th Street to the Pat Hamilton Gallery and see some of his shows. And I actually met him once and sort of overheard one of his conversations. He was a very wonderful, generous, funny guy. And I personally think in a lot of ways, uh, he's maybe one of the best painters of the figurative tableau since Max Beckman. And I, I have all kinds of respect for him. He's also a pretty interesting colorist. And he can be very delicate when he wants to. This piece is White Squad by Leon Golub. 1982 acrylic on linen with metal grommets. White Squad 1 is the first of seven large-scale paintings that Leon Golub made in the early 1980s in response to activities of Central and South American Death Squad, which received significant media attention at the time. I think that Leon Golub also presents a very interesting example as a painter. I believe he was from Chicago and was even part of the Monster roster. And then he moved to New York in the mid-60s and had a certain kind of initial flash of recognition. But when painting died and minimalism and conceptualism kind of took charge, his type of humanistic figuration was really pushed out of the spotlight and he just stayed and I believe he might have been teaching at NYU but he kept grinding and grinding and grinding and then after about 20 years I believe it was Susan Caldwell gave him his first showing of these works I just uh, look at his draftsmanship and the details that he is able to pick out, what he accentuates and doesn't accentuate, and from a strictly formalistic figurative painting aspect, I think he's a very accomplished artist. This particular shot of this hand makes me think of Egon Schiele. One element I always like to check out when I'm looking at figurative, figurative artists is their ability to draw hands or to articulate anatomical forms maybe in foreshortened or in various perspectival uh, ways. This uh, reclining form on the bottom here of this woman is also fantastic and the way that he renders this face and that nose and lips, this is, this is masterly. You know, he had uh, people who would come in and he would make these paintings and then paint over them and he had people who would come in and scrape them down with meat cleavers, spend hours. That's how he achieved that uh, kind of unique abraded surface. Well, here is probably the more, most highly recognized superstar of the 1980s. This is a painting by Julian Schnabel and it's titled Hope. Oil and Velvet on Velvet. In the late 1970s, Julian Schnabel responded somewhat rebelliously to contemporary critiques of painting by embracing the medium, later acknowledging, I thought that if painting was dead, then it's a nice time to start painting. He took up this challenge by incorporating unusual materials ranging from broken ceramic plates to unexpected supports such as tarpaulin and velvet into many of his works and routinely making large-scale paintings. And they talk about him being kind of rebellious and uh, doing kind of <laughs> gestures just to tweak the critics. And his painting on velvet was a good example of that. I mean, up to that point, people would, when you'd say I'm painting on velvet, they would think of the Mexican paintings of Elvis on velvet. Also, this is about the same time that uh, 
David Lynch came out with the movie Blue Velvet, so maybe that's some kind of a an analogy or a reference to Julian paying attention to the movies. I actually don't think this is maybe one of Julian's better paintings. There's uh, there's a lot of stuff going on, and it's it's surprising that they would have this on display rather than one of his much better known pieces on broken plates. And if you've been watching the Calm Report, you know that he went back and did another series of broken plate paintings that were based on the roses found around Van Gogh's grave. This piece is by Eric Fischel, and it's titled A Visit To Slash A Visit From The Island, 1983, Oil on Canvas, 84 by 168 inches. Eric Fischel is a painter who I think has had his ups and downs. This particular piece I think is part of the, one of the up parts, wonderful rendering on the, the character of this face here. Uh, some people have actually compared him to Monet, and that's that's high praise. I don't know whether I'd go that far, but I do think that he's he's very good in his ability to create a narrative, to use figures, to express an idea or have kind of a dramatic content that he works with. Actually, the white uh, dress this lady is wearing is nice. The contrast there of kind of the masked out black silhouette against the waves. Also. Again, he's got these two panels contrasted. The one of this tragic scene of, I guess it's people from a shipwreck. Then on the other side, we have kind of the upper middle class vacationers, the white peachy skinned uh, visitors that are coming in and enjoying all the good benefits that uh, their lifestyle and their economic and uh, demographic units provide them. James Calm, fast forward, painting of the 80s at the Whitney Museum. Thank you, Kate.